welcome once again to this time that we have to share together the Word of God. I look forward to this with anticipation because it gives us that opportunity to fellowship one with another around the Word of God, to let God speak to us, to let God reveal to us His will, uh, that we might be what we ought to be. We welcome, of course, our church family. We welcome our special guests. We welcome those that will be new, that will join with us. And we deeply appreciate each and every person that meets with us during this time of Bible study. And our prayer is that God will be glorified and that you will be blessed and that we might begin, if have not already done so, an opportunity to fellowship regularly around the Word of God with each other. There is a time in which we really, really need fellowship with God and fellowship with each other. And the comfort that we can find and the comfort we need can only be found in the Word of God. So today, I want to share with you a message I've entitled, Forgetting God is Costly. Forgetting God is Costly. And I want you to take time, if you have your Bibles, to turn to the Old Testament book of Haggai. And our scripture will be taken out of chapter 1 and chapter 2. The book of Haggai. Father, today, as you give us this opportunity, we pray for an anointing upon the message that the words we speak will be your words, the power that's realized will be your gift, that you'll be glorified, that Christ be lifted up, the Holy Spirit will be able to touch receptive hearts as they listen, as they obey the Word of God. Please bless the audiences, bless each and every one that will uh, partake of this message, no matter what time of the day or week that they might. And we pray now, Lord, that for that liberty to break the bread of life, that'll bring honor to you, for we ask it in Christ's name, amen. In this particular book, we find the story of how God's people in the midst of tremendous blessings, all of a sudden, everything changed. Everything changed. No matter what they did, there was no going forward. It seemed like everything that they'd done went two steps backward. And they began to inquire of the Lord, what's taking place? What's happening? It's kind of a similar story of today. They're still on the hearts and minds of people. What has happened? What has happened? We look for a moment and there's nothing that hadn't changed. What a blessed nation we have been. Why have those blessings appeared to stop? And it was a question that they began to go to the Lord with and wondering why. And then we would look at chapter 1 in verse 6. We find because they were concerned, God points out, first of all, their failure. Now look at verse 6. You see, they had become self-sufficient. They had forgot God. They had put Him aside. Notice, you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. He clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. So he addresses that everything that they had brought to him was true. In every part of their life, there had been a change. Those blessings had turned into no blessings. And as we begin to look at this story, uh, God begins to identify what was taking place. First of all, lifestyle had become their God. 
They'd taken plenty of time uh, to be involved in the physical life, but the spiritual life had begun to wane away, forgetting that God is the giver of all gifts. All good gifts come down from heaven according to James chapter 1. When they were in the fellowship of the Lord, it appeared that almost everything they touched was blessed. But now it had done reversal. And nothing they were doing. Nothing they were doing. And God begins to point out what they said was true. In every area of their life, there was a want, there was a need. We look today at the current situation. There's economical need. There's physical need. But the greatest need right now, as it was at this time in Israel, was the spiritual need. The spiritual need. And the Bible has told us that that which happens to Israel is an example that we should learn from. But evidently, America has not learned that. God's people in America have not learned that. Because the Bible says very plainly, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We remember as we read the Old Testament, we read about Israel, how that when they walked in the fellowship of God, when they put God first, there was nothing withheld. There was no enemy that couldn't be overcome. There was no need that wasn't provided. But each and every time that they began to exalt self and forget the Savior, forget God Almighty, then there was a travesty or a tragedy that began to take place. And God was allowing that, first of all, because of judgment, but also as an opportunity to get the attention of His people. To obey is better than sacrifice. Look at it. You see, God was getting the leftovers. There had become no time for God. God was not in the plan. God was not in the purpose. And so this began to take place in Israel. And we see very plainly. Then next I notice, then God gives them the information that they themselves had cut off the blessings of God. So I would invite you to Haggai chapter 1 verses 9 through 11. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. So no matter what we obtain without God's blessing, it has no value or no lasting. No matter how hard they were working, no matter how they went about to be industrious, the Bible said because that they had forgotten God, they had ceased to put him first. Look at it. I didn't blow up on it. God scattered it. God scattered it. Why? Why? Well, God's going to tell them why. Saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man unto his own house, which represents the spiritual part and need of life, had been forsaken for the physical part of life. There was great emphasis on putting what physically was needed. There was goals that were set to obtain it. But at the same time, the worship, the house represents worship. God's house is a place of worship. And we ought to be worshiping God in our own homes. But we begin to neglect God representing worship. We became casual and contemporary, and it had to be convenient. And we forgot that our first obligation, as well as privilege, is to put God first. To put God first. And notice what he says there. He said, and you run every man into his own house. So the effort, the greatest effort, was to put to the physical needs of individuals instead of the spiritual needs and God, therefore, was getting, if he got anything, leftovers. Leftovers. Notice in verse 10. Therefore, why? He just told us, ladies and gentlemen, in verse number 9. 
Therefore, the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. The dew represents the blessings of God. You see, ladies and gentlemen, when we forsake God, then God turns off the blessings. Dew represents the fertility of, the, of growth. He said, because you've rejected me, I'll turn the blessings off. I'll turn the blessings off. And notice what he said very plainly. And the earth is stayed from her fruit. And without the blessings of God, ladies and gentlemen, which we have witnessed this past six and a half to seven months, without the blessings of God, everything, not some things, everything, everything goes the wrong way. You look at the world today, changes have been made that we in our wildest imagination would have never thought possible. But God is showing us the high cost of not putting God first. Because without me, you can do nothing, Jesus said in John chapter 15. The Bible tells us every, every time we look at it, James chapter 1 is, is absolute. All good gifts come down from the Father above. Not some. Not some all. Everything that's good that you received or I received is because of the grace and the goodness and the generosity of Almighty God. But look at it. He tells them very plainly. And God's telling America very plainly. Well, you forgot me. I'll cut the blessings off. I'll cut the direction off. You want to do it your way? Go for it. You want to neglect me? You think that you have a better answer? You think that you don't need me? Go for it. And what a tragedy and what a high cost lesson we are learning. Evidently we haven't learned it because it's not changed, but we are learning it. We are learning it. And notice what he said. Look at verse 11. And I call for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corns, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth. Financial. Financial. We've experienced one of the greatest financial rearrangements in modern times. How many businesses are no more? How many people have totally become bankrupt? And let me get down even more spiritually. We'll be surprised as we begin to learn how many churches have been shut down. God says that He will withdraw the blessings from the financial structure. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Without God's anointing and blessing, look at it and notice what He said. And then He said, upon men. Now, look at me. Some of you are going to say no. He showed us the COVID-19 is the withdrawal. God didn't cause it, but He didn't prevent it. He didn't cause it, but He didn't prevent it. Because we, as a society, of course not everyone, but as the majority of society, like Israel, have become self-sufficient, self-centered, and in our foolishness, absolute foolishness begin to have the idea that we didn't need God no more. That we was doing a pretty good job. We had, we had more than we'd ever had. But God said, when you forsake me, I'll cut them blessings off. And then look what he said there again. He'll call upon a drought. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God sends the rains. God causes the growth. Everything, ladies and gentlemen, that's necessary to humanity, 
from the very air we breathe comes from Almighty God. We have nothing, we have nothing on our own but that unconfessed sin. Listen to me, look what he says here very plainly. And he said, upon men, look at it. How many have been afflicted by COVID-19? How many's lost their life? How much financial, how much rearranging of a person's life has taken place because of this pandemic? Look at it. Look at it. And upon cattle, upon the labor of the hands. That talks about the economy. That talks about the workforce. The workforce. I believe, and please uh, don't hold me to this, but I believe one of the major airlines is fixed to lay off 29,000 people. Now that's just one company. 29,000 people. And that's just, that's just the beginning of the devastation that has taken place in the workforce, in the business community. Look at it. God tells them very plainly. And then thirdly, the reason that they forgot to put God first, go to Haggai chapter 2 and verse 3. They were resting on what they had done in the past and thought it was sufficient for the present. They rested on their past thinking it was sufficient for the present. Who's left among you that saw this house in her first glory? Who, who's, who's left among you that, that as a nation saw the importance of serving God. Who is it? Who is it? And how do you see it now? How do you see it now? We have so departed from biblical worship and have instituted that social gospel that talent to uh, replace worship. Worship. Do you know there was a time that Sunday, the Lord's Day, was reverenced. But instead of being God's holy day to worship, we turned it into man's holiday. Now, I don't need no response and emails or nothing. I know there are requirements on the Lord's day and that's predetermined by him. I'm not talking to people that have to work. I'm not talking about people that have to do something on the Lord's day. I'm talking about those people that have no excuse for not worshiping God in his house. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves as the manner of some as as you see the day approaching, the Bible tells us very plainly that we're not to forsake the house of God. Now, providential circumstances, that's fine. That's fine. Now, if you happen to be a person that you think it's no special day, or you don't see no need, go for it. But God's people know, those that are right with the Lord know that they ought to be in the house of God. Now we have been limited because of the pandemic. But when there's opportunities given, we need to be in the house of God to fellowship with him and each other. So look at it. Notice what it says. Then the Bible said now. And how do you see it now? It's not needful. As I desire. It's, it's not a conviction no more. It's just if I have opportunity. And look what he said. Is it not in your eyes a comparison of it as nothing? That's where we got in trouble. The worship of God has become as nothing. The house of God has become as nothing. The right to teach our children and, and, and have our home in the fellowship of God has become nothing. Nothing. 
But see the danger of resting on past accomplishments. What we are doing is unimportant compared with what we have done in the past. Our job is not to compare, but to complete the job that God has given us at the present time. And then I want you to notice it in closing. He then begins to remind them of the blessings that come from putting God first. And if we want things to be turned around, this is what's got to take place. First of all, if we put God first, look at Haggai 2.5. God will be with us. According to the word that I covet with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. We have the promise that God will be with us again if we repent. If we repent, I don't mean feel sorry. I don't mean come and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I mean repent. We have viciously self-choice refused God. Repent. Look at verse 7. He promised he would fill his house with his glory. We can once again assemble in the house of God and we can, can experience the, the power of God. Look at it. And I will shake all nations. And the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory. Saith the Lord of hosts. Then we'll see people saved. We'll see lives changed. We'll see God's people encouraged. We'll see the joy of salvation. That he gives us to restore. We'll see the peace that he promised. To be realized. We'll see that God's people once again. Will become contented. And then notice in verse 9. In fact, he promises if we'll repent and we'll come back and put God first, we will see him bless even greater than ever before. Look at verse 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former. Oh, God has blessings. I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart those things God has prepared for them. Oh, look at it. Look at it. Saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. God's waiting to bless if we just repent. And then he tells us also, he assures them that the promises of God are based upon them putting first. Look at verse 19. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth from this day will I bless you. God's blessings are poured out, not because of the holiness of his people, but because of his grace. In choosing to put God first, they have placed themselves on the path of God's blessings. We can never earn the blessings of God, but our obedience places us at the riverbank where the blessings can flow from God's goodness and grace. The only way to get ahead is to put God before us. Don't wait for great things. The opportunity may never come your way. Do the little things that are constantly before you daily for the glory of God. Here's the lesson I'm through. We need to repent, ladies and gentlemen. And we need to tell God from a broken heart, we're sorry that we were foolish enough to think that we could do without him. And would he please, would he please forgive us and heal our land? He said that. In 2 Corinthians, he tells us very, I mean, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It's up to his people. It's up to us. It's up to us. Let us confess our failure and ask God to forgive us that he might heal our land. Heavenly Father, help us to understand what you told Israel here in Haggai. Because we've made the same mistake. In our foolishness. In our foolishness. We became so self-centered. And so self-sufficient. We failed to realize that we were obtaining this by our Savior. So Father let us repent. Let us stop making excuses. Let us be brutally honest. We're guilty, Lord. As a nation, as individuals, we're guilty. We have tried to do what only you can do. 
And Lord, you showed us. That's foolish. Once again, let me say, because it grips my heart. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. James reminds us that in chapter 1 of his epistle, that all good gifts, not some, all come down from you. Let us return, Lord, to the fellowship of our Savior, our God, our King, that you might heal the land. Bless the message now, Lord, and we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen. To you that are not saved, please stay with us for just a little bit longer. We have a video presentation, a short one, that will detail to you what God's asking you to do to be saved as a child of God. If you need to understand that God is the only way, I pray for that enlightenment to you. Bless now and we'll praise you until next time we meet. May God bless you. Amen.